So chapter eight is about fixed and circulating capital. Um, and there's this tension in Marx's analysis between what is fixed um, and what is fluid or what is static and what is in motion. And so this becomes a question of how motion negotiates with fixity. Do you think that Marx would have thought it possible to see capital moving through um, the walls of a, a Wall Street skyscraper or in the cogs of a machine or even something as static um, as the physical infrastructure of a bridge or an airport? You know, I sometimes have this imagination. I look at the New York skyline, and you see this kind of, then it's all fixed. And then you think of what is moving through it. And physically, there's all sorts of things moving through it. People, electricity, you know, all the rest of it, water, sewage, you know. Uh, but there's also money moving through it. And, and, and you, you start to think about the flows of money which are associated. And, and I think that that is in incredibly important. I was reading something the other day that kind of was talking about the New York skyline, and it kind of said basically, when you look at the New York skyline, uh, you not only have to see it as an architectural production, but you also have to see it as a production of finance capital and the credit system. And when you put it in those terms, I think it's a very interesting juxtaposition. But this tension in Marx between fixity and motion is, is incredibly important, and to me, that chapter has an immense significance uh, because what is uh, a city if it's not a huge amount of fixed capital? And yet there's a lot of motion within the city. And the design of the city has to be such to, to facilitate the motion. So you try to build the highways and you try to build uh, the communication infrastructures and all the rest of it. So for me, you know, with my interest in urban, issues. Uh, the, the chapter on fixed capital is absolutely crucial for understanding the relationship between Marx's uh, analysis of economic dynamics and the production of urbanization. Okay, so this week we deal with the, uh, the question of uh, f fixed capital. And um, it's already cropped up uh, quite a few times in the text. And it, I don't know if you notice, but uh, every time it does, it seems like, uh, well, there's something going on that's different with fixed capital, and we have to sort this out at some point or other. And so <clears throat> these chapters are meant to sort it out. Um, but uh, the fixed capital question does not go away, it comes back. Uh, in future chapters as well. And I think it's a terribly important category in Marx's theory. And we have to grapple with what it's all about. Um, as usual, this, is, uh, this chapter is, uh, well, these chapters are, are a little bit dry and technical and um, incomplete. And when I came to write a chapter on fixed capital in the book I did many years ago called Limits to Capital, I actually found that uh, I was referring more to the Grundrisse than I was uh, to uh, volume two. And uh, when I went back and checked uh, the Grundrisse in volume two, I realized why. Uh, first, the language in uh, the Grundrisse is much more exuberant and uh, exciting and colorful, which uh, I'm sorry to say always appeals to me. Um, but the second reason is that there are some issues covered in the Grundrisse which are pretty much buried here. And in some instances, I think the sort of in your face statements in the Grundrisse are much more helpful uh, if you have them in front of you before you actually go through volume two. Now, for those of you who are kind of want to be aficionados of uh, fixed capital, um, it starts around page 685 in the Grundrisse, and as you know, the Grundrisse are kind of notes but from about page 6 to 85 on for the next uh, 30 or 40 pages, fixed capital is all over the place. 
And I thought it would be interesting to start by uh, getting you to look at just a couple of passages from this piece I've sent around. Has everybody got a copy of this? Um, I mean, the sort of thing I mean is uh, if you go to page 706, I mean, there's some great stuff at the top of the page on contradictions and so on, which uh, we're not actually concerned with here, but at the bottom of the page, he says this, nature builds no machines, no locomotives, railways, electric telegraph, self-acting mules, etc. These are products of human industry, natural material transformed into organs of the human will over nature, or of human participation in nature. They are organs of the human brain created by the human hand the power of knowledge objectified. The development of fixed capital indicates to what degree general social knowledge has become a direct force of production, and to what degree, hence, the conditions of the process of social life itself have come under the control of the general intellect and been transformed in accordance with it. To what degree the powers of social production have been produced, not only in the form of knowledge, but also as immediate organs of social practice of the real life process. And this is the kind of language I'm talking about that's all over the place in the Grundrisse, and I think as you can see it's, 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 it's very graphic. And there's an evocation of how fixed capital has entered to the landscape of capitalism. So you're looking at New York City and you say, look at all that fixed capital. I mean, this is pretty astonishing. Uh, and you think of the railroads and you think of the highways and you think of the ports and the airports and all this kind of stuff. I mean, we live in a world of fixed capital which is transformed, the transformation of nature which is, uh, which is, which is absolutely uh, astonishing and Marx I think is picking up on that sort of idea here in ways that don't happen uh, in the volume two uh, presentation. Uh, the other thing that comes out I think very clearly in the Grundrisse, um, which is a bit buried in, in, in volume two, is the framework that Marx is, is setting up here, and, and the contrast. Uh, essentially, if you look at it like this, and you list the sort of physical characteristics we're looking at, uh, we're looking at machinery, we're looking at factories, we're looking at uh, physical infrastructures, all of those elements. And these are the elements that Marx calls fixed capital. There are then other elements, like uh, auxiliary materials, Uh, materials, and the primary one to think about here would be energy. And then there are, if you like, all of the physical inputs into the production, the physical inputs, the raw materials, the intermediate products and all the rest of it that are then going to be processed into the, the commodity. And then, of course, there is labor power. And all of this is circulating capital. Now, Marx then introduces some other categories here, which he occasionally uses. That is, you can draw a line under here and actually then say everything above is really means of labor, or as he sometimes calls it, means of production in a very narrow sense. They are the instruments and the external forces that the laborer uses in then the physical inputs 
these are really the object of labour. And labour power, of course, is the subjective element. So there's a different division he sets up between means of labour, object of labour, and the subjective element. But all of this is very different from the categories that he has been working with right throughout Volume 1. And the two categories he works with in Volume 1 are constant capital and variable capital. Now, these, this way of categorizing things which we're going to mainly be looking at here, which is mainly the relationship between fixed capital and circulating capital, with occasional looks at means of labour and objects of labour and the subjective element, is it's a very different division from constant capital and variable capital. What you see here is of course the theory of surplus value. So out of this configuration, you see the production of surplus value, which is why those are the categories he uses in Volume 1. Here you're looking at something completely different, you're looking at the motion of capital. Can you see surplus value in these categories? No, you can't. So Marx is, is very careful to alert us, you know, that using these categories conceals something. What it does is to conceal the theory of surplus value. But what it reveals is something very important about the motion of capital, how it moves. Now, what Marx does is to take this as the central critique that he has of Adam Smith and of Ricardo. And so I'm going to jump up into these passages and go to page 297, which in a sense is a statement of Marx's objections to how Smith and Ricardo were so fascinated by the distinction between fixed and circulating capital that they forgot or couldn't see the theory of surplus value. And so he says in this first main paragraph, we can thus understand why bourgeois political economy held instinctively to Adam Smith's confusion of the categories, fixed and circulating categories fixed and circulating capital with the categories constant and variable capital, and uncritically echoed it from one generation down to the next for a whole century. It no longer is distinguished at all between the portion of capital laid out on wages and the portion of capital laid out on raw material, and only formally distinguished the former from constant capital in terms of whether it was circulated bit by bit or all at once through the product. The basis for understanding the real movement of capitalist production and thus of capitalist exploitation was thus submerged at one blow. All that was involved on this view was the reappearance of values advanced. Now I suggested you look at the Ricardo and Adam Smith kind of chapters very lightly, um, but the essence, that's the essence of his critique, is they became very, very interested in these categories. And they became very interested in them for another very, very particular reason. And the particular reason was that for them, capital was a thing. It was a stock, a stock of assets that were then put in motion by labour. 
Marx's definition of capital is not a thing definition, right? It's value in motion. It's, it's, a, it's a process definition. It is that circulation process that we studied in the first four chapters. It's a kind of continuing, so, so capital is that circulation process. So Marx is thinking circulation. They are thinking stocks, and in a sense you can say, well, what we'll be looking at here is stocks and flows. But Marx has on his hands a certain paradox, because fixed capital does indeed act like a stock for a certain period of time. So while Marx prefers the language of flows, he's got to deal with the fact that as a use value, it is a stock. When you look at the fixed capital in Manhattan, you see it, it's a thing, it's big, it's huge. And, it, it is, it, it, and, and you can't evade its thingness. And while you can say, well actually, if you look at all those buildings, instead of looking at their thingness, you imagined capital is circulating through them. I mean, you look at the building and you see the interest rate trickling out here and the income coming in there, you know, I mean, capital is moving through those buildings, and I, th and I think that's perfectly fine to think that, but you've still got the nature of the building. So there's a tension in, in Marx's analysis. And that tension is taken up very clearly in the Grundrisse on the next page. It doesn't come out ter terribly clearly, well, it's hidden if you cross, go over the page. Marx says this in the Grundrisse, Grundrisse page 694, the development of the means of labour into machinery is not an accidental moment of capital, but is rather the historical reshaping of the traditional inherited means of labour into a form adequate to capital. Now, this notion of a form adequate to capital, if you go back to the chapter on machinery, Marx talks about the development of machinery in the factory system as a form of technological organisation that is adequate to capital. And it was only when it came up with that that it found its own technological, its unique technological basis. So this is echoing that idea here. And then he goes on, the accumulation of knowledge and of skill of the general productive forces of the social brain is thus absorbed into capital as opposed to labour, and hence appears as an attribute of capital, and more specifically of fixed capital, insofar as it enters into the production process as a means of production proper. Machinery appears then as the most adequate form of fixed capital, and fixed capital, insofar as capital's relations with itself are concerned, appears as the most adequate form of capital as such. Here comes the tension. In another respect, however, insofar as fixed capital is condemned to an existence within the confines of a specific use value, it does not correspond to the concept of capital, which as value is indifferent to every specific form of use value and can adopt or shed any of them as equivalent incarnations. In this respect, as regards capital's external relations, it is circulating capital, which appears as the adequate form of capital and not fixed capital. Now what this passage does for me is, is to highlight a, an immense tension in the landscape of capital between fixity and motion, between stasis and flow, between stock and flow. It's an unavoidable tension, but it's going to pose Marx a lot of problems. I mean, here he is, on both of these things we've read out about fixed capital, kind of saying, My, you know, fixed capital is the apogee of the whole, it's a, it represents the sort of conquest of the world, the power of knowledge objectified, all those kinds of things. So he's saying all of these incredible things about fixed capital, and then he's saying, but the trouble with fixed capital is, it's fixed. And it's fixed in its form, as a use value, and some of it, as we see, is fixed in space. But capital is all about motion. So how does motion negotiate with fixity? 
And this is, a, 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 if you like, a fascinating kind of problem. And one that, that I certainly would make a lot of. Because that tension between fixity and motion is, this can be, and we get many hints of it in here, the source of crises. The fixity will not give way to the motion. The motion needs to break the fixity in order to keep in motion. And if you think of it in landscape terms, which Marx doesn't think of, but I do, if you look at the landscape of capital in the era of railroads, you would see a certain kind of fixed structures around which capital was moving. And those fixed structures were perfectly adequate for capital for many a year. But as capital became faster and moved and all this kind of stuff, the railroads became less and less adequate. So you have the internal combustion engine and you start to say, you know, highways and then you have the jet transport and you have, you know, then you have containerization. In, in, in other words, in other words, the landscape of capital at a particular historical moment is adequate to capital at that moment, but is not adequate at a later time as the system grows and expands and, and as accumulation proceeds. So what you get is what I would call creative destruction on the land. You have to destroy the old landscape to build the new. So the deindustrialization of, of, of America in the 1980s, 1990s was a classic example of the destruction of a particular landscape which had been extremely successful. And then suddenly you look at all these vacant buildings, and what on earth are you going to do with all those vacant buildings? And you know, well you turn, you know, textile mills into condominiums or something. I mean, you know, you've got to do something with it. You've got to recycle them somehow. So, so the, the relationship between fixity and motion in the history of capital is, is a fascinating topic. At least it is to me, it may not be to you, you know. I mean, you know. So I think that actually this is a very telling point here, which Marx is, is, is pushing on in general in the Grundrisse, and there's far more about this in the Grundrisse than there is in Volume 2 of Capital. There are bits of it in Volume 2 of Capital, and you can kind of use that, uh, and, but you have to put them into, if you like, the sort of picture I'm, 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 I'm creating here of this tension between fixity and motion. So with that in mind then, let's take a look more closely at fixed capital and circulating capital and what that's all about. One of the things that immediately strikes you <coughs> is the language which he uses. He uses the word peculiar, peculiarity several times, and actually he uses that in the Grundrisse as well. So on the middle of the first page he says, the peculiarity of this part of the constant capital, the means of labour in the strict sense, is this. And then he goes on, right at the bottom, to say, as a means of labour uh, functions and is used up, one part of its value passes over to the product, while another part remains fixed in the means of labour and hence in the production process. The value fixed in this way steadily declines until the means of labour is worn out and has therefore distributed its value in a longer or shorter period over the volume of products that has emerged from a series of continually repeated labour processes. As long as a means of labour still remains effective, now I want you to, to be very careful about that, it remains effective. What does this mean? As long as it remains effective, he says, and does not yet have to be replaced by a new item of the same kind, some constant capital value remains fixed in it, while another part of the value originally fixed in it passes over to the product and thus circulates as a component of the commodity stock. The longer the means of labour lasts and the more slowly it wears out, the longer the constant capital value remains fixed in the use form, 
But whatever its degree of durability, the proportion in which it gives up value is always in inverse ratio to the overall duration of its function. If two machines are of equal value but one of them wears out in five years and the other in ten, then the first gives up twice as much value in the same space of time as the second does. Again, in the next paragraph, it's a peculiar form of circulation. In the first place, it does not circulate in its use form. It is rather its value that circulates. And this does so gradually, bit by bit, in the degree to which it is transferred to the product that circulates as a commodity. This peculiarity, he goes on to say, is what gives this part of constant capital a form of fixed capital. All other material components of the capital advance in the production process, on the other hand, form by contrast to its circulating or fluid capital. So, the use value remains fixed, and the value keeps flowing. Okay, you look at the skyscraper and you say, well, the skyscraper is still there tomorrow, it hasn't you know, flown away, it hasn't moved. It's fixed, and it remains fixed for a long time. On the other hand, the amortization stream and the interest rates that are paid on it are flowing out while the incomes are flowing in. So something's flowing through it. And it's very interesting to, to look at buildings as sites of flows. Flows of people, flows of electricity, flows of water, flows of sewage. I mean, the whole thing is a, is a mass of flows. But on the other hand, it still has this quality of a thing. So the use value and the value are actually separated from each other in what they are doing in this whole thing. And this introduces a bit of a dilemma for capital. Uh, the first dilemma is, 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 I think, best, best set out on 240, about the middle there. The more slowly this value is given up, and the means of labour gives up value with each repetition of the same labour process, the greater is the capital still fixed, and the greater the difference between the capital employed in the production process and the capital consumed in it. The capital employed includes the whole value of the fixed capital. The capital consumed, however, is only that bit of the value of the fixed capital which passes into the commodity. And right now he's using what we call a straight line depreciation idea, that if the value, if the value at, at, at time one, or time zero, is say ten, and, and the thing lasts for ten years, then over time the value just drops down to zero at year ten and it's a straight line kind of process. That is, one-tenth of the value disappears every, every year. Um, so this is, a, I think, one of the, the features of what we're talking about here. And then he uh, then says on 241, what he later says on 297, again in the critique of Ricardo and all the rest of it, he says on 241, besides their basic error, their confusion of the categories of fixed and circulating capital with the categories of constant variable capital, confusion in the demarcation of concepts made by previous economists rests primarily on the following points. So that we've already covered. Firstly, certain properties that characterize the means of labor materially are made into direct properties of fixed capital, e.g. physical immobility such as that of a house but it is always easy to show that other means of labour, which are also of such fixed capital, ships for example, have the opposite property, i.e. physical mobility. So fixed capital is not necessarily fixed in space, some of it is, some of it's not. Some of it's mobile, some of it's not. And he does cover this at a number of particular points, so let's look at those. On page 242, other means of labour, however, are produced from the start in this static form, tied to the spot, such as improvements to the soil, factory buildings, blast furnaces, canals, railways, etc. The continued attachment of the means of labour to the production process in which it is to function is here simultaneously conditioned by its sensuous mode of existence. 
On the other hand, a means of labour may constantly change its physical place, i.e. move, and yet be engaged throughout in the production process, as with a locomotive, a ship, draft, cattle, etc. Immobility does not give it the character of fixed capital in the one case, nor does mobility remove this character in the other. But the circumstance that some means of labour are fixed in location, with their roots in the soil, gives this part of the fixed capital a particular role in the nation's economy. They cannot be sent abroad, or circulate as commodities on the world market. It is quite possible for the property titles to this fixed capital to change, as we've seen in housing markets, for example, with securitization and you know, selling the mortgages to selling lousy mortgages to some Norwegian municipality which then can't pay its employees when they all go bust. So you can ship around the property titles, they can be bought and sold, and in this respect circulate ideally. These property titles can even circulate on foreign markets in the form of shares, for example. But a change in the persons who are the owners of this kind of fixed capital does not change the relationship between the static and materially fixed part of the wealth of a country and the movable part of it. Now this topic comes back again uh, much further, uh, further on, 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 on page 288-9. to nine. And this is in the chapter on Adam Smith. So let's look at that, 288-9. to nine. I'm sorry I'm jumping around, but you have to jump around actually in this text to keep some of the topics Otherwise you get into it, and then you get out of it, and then you get back into it. And get, you know. So here he says, a spinning machine, for instance, has no use value if it is not used for spinning, does not function as an element of production. And thus from the capitalist standpoint, as a fixed component of productive, of productive capital. But the spinning machine is mobile. It can be exported from the country where it is produced and be sold directly or indirectly to a foreign country, whether in exchange for raw materials or for champagne. In the country where it was produced, it then functions only as commodity capital, but never, not even after its sale, as fixed capital. However, products that have been localized by being incorporated into the earth, and hence can only be used locally, factory buildings, railways, bridges, tunnels, docks, etc., soil improvements and so on, cannot be exported body and soul, they are immobile. If they are not to be useless, they must function after their sale as fixed capital, in the country in which they were produced. Now the implication of that is that if you have fixed capital in the land, circulating capital has to go there and validate it. And if no circulating capital goes there, the fixed capital is useless. So in order for the, the value of that fixed capital embodied in the land to be recuperated, fixed capital has to attract or circulating capital has to be sort of mandated, as it were, to go there rather than somewhere else. So this is where you get the fixity in motion. And the way I sort of think of this, you know, I mean, on the one hand, the fixity is, is the airport, the motion is the airplane. If you build an airport and no planes come to it, what kind of fixed capital is that? It's useless. So you've got to make sure all the planes come there. So there's competition between the different airports to try and get as much trade as they possibly can. So the circulating part has to obey, if you like, the dictates of the fixed part. If the value in the fixed part is going to be realized, if the, the airport lasts, say, 30 years, before you know, you've got all your money back out of having built it and all that kind of thing, and it's, and, and, and you're prepared to abandon it, if it lasts 30 years, then for 30 years, circulating capital has to keep on going through it. And that's the implication of this. But he then goes on to say, for the capitalist producer who builds factories speculatively, or improves estates in order to sell them, these things are the form of his commodity capital. And so according to Smith, the form of his circulating capital. But from the society standpoint, they must ultimately function as fixed capital if they are not to be useless. In the country in question, in a production process fixed by their own location. It in no way follows from this that immobile objects, as such, are automatically fixed capital. They may be dwelling houses, 
that belong to the consumption fund. Here's another thing. Fixed capital is what is used in the production process. But consumers also need something fixed, and this is termed the consumption fund. So, knives and forks are part of the, your fixed capital, sort of in the household, and therefore they are not fixed capital in Marx's definition, they are part of the consumption fund. And of course we live our lives in houses and all the rest of it, so they're all part of the consumption fund, but the consumption fund is also often fixed in space and often has a long life. So consumers then have to act in a certain way in relationship to the consumption fund so that the money can be got back from whatever is put into the consumption fund. So, they, as he says, they may be dwelling houses, etc., that belong to the consumption fund and thus do not form part of the social capital at all, even though they form an element of the social wealth of which capital is only one part. The producer of these things, to express ourselves in Smith's terms, makes a profit by their sale, so they're circulating capital. The person who puts them to use, their ultimate buyer, can use them only by em employing them in the production process. And then he talks about property titles changing and, and all the rest of it. The middle paragraph of 289 is also interesting. The locally fixed means of labour, those inseparable from the soil, even though they may function for their producer as commodity capital and do not form any element of his fixed capital, which for consists for him of the means of labour that he needs to build buildings, railways, etc., must necessarily function prospectively as fixed capital in the country in question. But it in no way follows, conversely, that fixed capital necessarily consists of immovable objects, and then the ship and the locomotive and so on. Um, so, here we have a component which is that aspect of fixed capital that's embedded in the land. And it has a very particular role to play in the economy of nations, it has a very, very important role to play in, if you like, corralling the circulation of circulating capital, so that the fixed capital, the value, gets utilised. Let's go back to 241. He then introduces another thing which you probably saw several times in this text, it comes up again and again. Towards the bottom of the main central paragraph he says this, if its material properties also allow it to serve for other functions than, of, than that of means of labour, then whether it is fixed capital or not depends on these various functions. Cattle as draught animals are fixed capital. When being fattened for slaughter, they are raw material that eventually passes into circulation as a product and so not fixed but circulating capital. There's another version of this, slightly different, on 281, 282. He says, the same things may form components of fluid or of fixed capital according to the different functions they perform in the labour process. Cattle used as draft cattle, means of labour for example, form a material mode of existence of fixed capital, while as fattening cattle, raw material, they are a component, part of the farmer's circulating capital. The same thing, moreover, can function at one time as a component of productive capital and at another time form part of the direct consumption fund. A house, for example, when it functions as a place of work, is a fixed component of productive capital. When it functions as a dwelling, it is in no way a form of capital in this capacity. The same means of labour can in many cases function at one time as means of production and at another time as means of consumption. Now, there are, this is Marx using the relationality idea that fixed capital is defined by what it relates to. And this is a, actually a terribly important idea. And when I hit this, um, it illuminated something for me that I, you know, had long struck me as odd. Uh, one of the theories of uh, capitalist development to which I was exposed in my, in my youth, 
was a book by uh, Walt Rostow called The Stages of Economic Growth. Uh, it was subtitled uh, A Non-Communist Manifesto. <laughs> and it, it really was, it was Cold War stuff, you know, and it was basically arguing that in order to confront the communist threat, you needed to have a development strategy that was going to bring high-grade consumerism to all that part of the world that the communists had not yet got to. I mean, there was a real fear that the communists were going to, you know, spread the wealth around and people were going to be better off and, you know, have good health care and all those kinds of things. And, uh, you know, the US government is terrified, everybody's terrified that the communists are going to succeed, so, uh, you know, they've got, well, we've got to have a development strategy. How do you get a low-income country out of poverty to the point of high consumerism? Well, said Rostow, you go through a number of stages. One is about the preconditions for forgotten how many stages, five or six stages. Um, the, 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 well, one was the sort of pre-capitalist condition, the second was creating the preconditions for growth. And in Rostow's version, that meant creating a lot of physical infrastructures, fixed capital formation, creating all the necessary infrastructures, particularly the physical infrastructures, the roads, all those kinds of things. The ports, the communication networks, all those kinds of things. And then there came the next stage, which he was called the takeoff into economic growth, which is that capital, looking at its situation where it had all of these infrastructures, it had the water supplies, it had the communications, would, would come in <coughs> and create development. And then that would, of course, be about employing people. And in the initial stages, of course, people would be employed at relatively low wages, but as time went on, consumer demand would need to pick up, and so there would be increasing wealth, and you'd get the drive to the era of mass consumption, which would then show the Ruskies they didn't know what they were doing. I mean, this is the kind of theoretical apparatus. And what he did was then to assemble a lot of data from different countries to look at the historical data and say, can I see phases of really strong fixed capital formation, where fixed capital formation is uh, about 7% of the economy and it jumps up to 18% or something like that, and we then see a gr strong growth spurt that follows. And he found a lot of data in a lot of countries to show, yeah, you could show that, you could show that. And it was, you know, quite compelling, and everybody kind of thought Rustow was onto something, and this was what, what, we should be, what we should be doing. The one big problem with his model was when people went look back and looked at Britain, you couldn't see it. It wasn't there. And Britain was the first place, really, to do this. So how come Britain took off without fixed capital formation? Now, this taking off on the basis of fixed capital formation requires that consumption be restrained. And there's some support for that argument, even in Marx. So if you go again to the Grundrisse, and you go to page 707, where Marx talks about the development of fixed capital indicates, in another respect, the degree of development of wealth generally or of capital. What Marx says, hence, only when a certain degree of productivity has already been reached, so that a part of production time is sufficient for immediate production, can an increasingly large part be applied to the production of the means of production. This requires that society be able to wait, which is exactly what Rostow's argument was. That a large part of the wealth already created can be withdrawn both from immediate consumption and for production for immediate consumption in order to employ this part for labour which is not immediately productive within the material production process itself. This requires a certain level of productivity and of relative overabundance, 
and more specifically a level directly related to the transformation of circulating capital into fixed capital. As the magnitude of relative surplus labour depends on the productivity of necessary labour, so does the magnitude of labour time, living as well as objectified, employed in the production of fixed capital depend on the productivity of the labour time spent in the direct production of products. Surplus population, from this standpoint, as well as surplus production is a condition for this. So Marx is also arguing that in order to build all of these physical infrastructures you need surplus population and you need surplus production. Which was exactly Rostow's point. Which then, sort of, of course, comes back to the question, well how would Marx explain the British case? Well, one of the things that explains it is, I think, quite simple. That actually, under mercantilism in Britain and the power of merchant capital, Britain had developed a tremendous amount of fixed physical infrastructures which were largely organised for consumption. And in doing that, of course, they had robbed much of the rest of the world through merchant capital, they you know, plundered the West Indies and set up the plantation system and all those kinds of things. So the British had surplus capital from all of that. They had a surplus population off the land, and they already had means of production embedded in the land in the way of you know, turnpikes and all those kinds of things, and they could simply convert them to productive uses. In other words, you didn't need investment, all you, all you needed was a conversion. And I think this idea of conversion from something which is in the consumer realm into something that is in the production realm is actually a very important argument in the history of capital. And it, and it works both ways. I think it's very, very fascinating actually that, say, in the early 19, 1970s, 1980, in the 1970s, let's go back to then, all the textile mills are closing down. All that fixed capital in the textile mills is disappearing. It's become useless. That's when you start to see people saying, well, maybe we can turn them into condominiums or something, you know, or, or museums or something. You know. At the same time, a new form of production is opening up in the sweatshops of Los Angeles, in which the fixed capital is now somebody's basement. Look at the tremendous savings that happen when you move from a vast factory and all its maintenance to, some, to a back room or a basement with a few sewing machines and people making shirts in sweated labour conditions. So you get a proliferation of sweatshops. And that had happened, of course, back in the 17th and 18th century in Britain, where the merchants used something called the putting out system. They would go to the peasants and say, OK, here's the cloth, turn it into this and this, and we will come back in one week and we want to see it all. The peasant's hut was the fixed capital. And by the way, what happens with microfinance right now? Huh? What are you doing? You're actually turning peasant's huts all over the place into the fixed capital. At the same time as the fixed capital, which is big stuff, is being devalued and destroyed. But that fixed capital which is being devalued and destroyed then gets recycled into the consumption fund. So you get a two-way move. On the one hand, stuff that's in the consumption fund suddenly becomes the fixed capital, and stuff that's fixed capital suddenly becomes the consumption fund. They become the condominiums. So I find Marx's relational definition here saying, well, you can't say just because we look at a thing that that's fixed capital. What you have to do is to say, what is it relating to? Is it relating to production or is it not? Is it relating to consumption or not? And even the definition of fixed capital is a relational definition. If we go back to the preceding chapter to fixed capital, it's about the turnover time. And fixed capital is that part of constant capital which is left over after one turnover time. Now, turnover times are very different. If you have very short turnover times, then obviously you've got a lot of fixed capital. If you've got long turnover time, the fixed capital may be, 
an analogous piece of fixed capital, uh, which is in a, a business turning over to very, you know, very fast, will actually turn into not being fixed capital. So what is fixed capital has this relational definition, depending upon where, where it is situated. And I think what, was so, what became so clear to me, I mean I was reading all about, well how come Britain didn't do this? Well, it had so much in the consumption fund it didn't need. It had a surplus, surplus capital. In fact, the big problem in Britain in the 17th and 18th century was surplus capital and not knowing what to do with it. In other words, you didn't have to save. And actually then what happens is that as time goes on, of course, British surplus capital starts to go somewhere else. It goes to the United States or it goes to Argentina. Finds a surplus population there and so, you know, actually it's the other way around than what Rostow was arguing, which is that you've got to, you know, tighten your belt and get a lot of fixed capital and, you know, going. Actually, the capital's big problem is how to dispose of the surpluses. And one of the ways you can dispose of the surpluses is, of course, by fixed capital investment. Which is one of my big arguments about how urbanization connects to capital accumulation. That is, surpluses of capital are being produced all of the time, often in vast amounts. What do you do with it? Well, put it in the built environment. Which has the benefit, by the way, if you don't know whether it's profitable or not for, you know, maybe 10 or 15 years. So you put it in, put more in, and then you get these speculative booms, what we've just been through. So these, these dynamics, I think, are, are actually, can be, can be extracted, if you like, from uh, this whole process. So you have these different conditions. Like I say, one is, you know, the notion of fixity, there's a difference between mobile and immobile. Then there's a the whole kind of question of, well, is it operating as circulating capital or fixed capital? Is it in the consumption fund? Is it in production? You have all of those sorts of choices. So as Marx starts to say, you know, these these definitions are, on the one hand, rather slippery. And, but the slipperiness is, I think, really interesting. I mean, one of the things people get impatient with Marx is, that is, is, is precisely the slipperiness of some of his categories and his definitions, their relationality. But here you see that the relationality is helpful in explaining quite a lot of the phenomena that we see going on around us like the recycling of buildings into the consumption fund or the use of the elements in the consumption fund as fixed capital. Let's pause here for a minute. Do you have any kind of comments or questions about the discussion so far? What is he with the difference between means of production and means of labor? Well, he sometimes, I mean, this, 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 this gets a little confusing because he sometimes says uh, means of production, and in volume one he'll say means of production and it'll mean all of this, you know. Uh, here, he's, when he uses means of production, he means uh, the means that the laborer uses to make something. The tools, the infrastructures, and all the rest of it. And he's differentiating that from um, the object of labor. So my means of production is my tools and all this kind of stuff. The object of labor is what I apply the tools for. Means of production would be uh, the potter's wheel. The uh, object of labor would be the clay. The means of labor. Means of labor, yes. No. No, the means of labor are the, are, 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 is his wheel. The object of labor. Is, is, is what is worked upon. Means of production, well, in volume one it's everything, but he sometimes slips in his, in his, in his language uh, and calls this means of production, and he should be saying means of, uh, means of labor. You'll find that actually in here a few times, I found it a few times. Uh, 
so it can get a little confusing. The same thing happens about circulating capital. Circulating capital is a, ca is a category that only operates, fixed capital and circulating capital only operate within the realm of production. It's not about the circuits of capital. So, you know, Marx always imagines that you, you're smart enough to know all these distinctions and he doesn't have to explain them to you, but, <laughs> you know, I, it, it, it can get confusing sometimes. Yeah? Where are the raw materials in your chart? Yeah, they're here. They're, they're exor you know, auxiliary materials, the physical inputs, the raw materials. Because but in the text he distinguishes between ancillary and yes. raw materials? Yes, auxiliary materials are the energy which is not incorporated in the product. The cotton goes into the shirt, the energy does not go into the shirt, it helps make the shirt. So auxiliary materials are, are, are not objects of labor, they are means, but they are circulating because the energy is totally used up during the production period. So in chapters 10 and 11, Marx is engaging with Smith and Ricardo, particularly around this question of fixed capital. Um, and I think one of the um, compelling things about Marx's analysis is that he's engaging with these classical political economists on their own terms and using their own categories. And what do you think was the strategic value for Marx in engaging um, with Smith and Ricardo on their own terms? And how do you think um, there could be strategic value for Marxist economists today in engaging a, in a similar sort of polemic with mainstream economists? It's partly a historical accident that Marx proceeded in this way. Um, at that time, there was no fields of, uh, say, uh, economic history. It was not a, a field. Um, it would be very difficult to have kind of written an economic history of capitalism from the 16th century onwards. Uh, and Marx was not really in a position to do that. So the very beginning of his tactic in capital is to take all of the political economists that had been writing from the sort of 16th century onwards and to say in a way they were trying to understand this new world that was emerging around them and they all saw something important about it. And through a critique of them you would come to a critical understanding of what was going on in that world. So this gives a great deal of authority to classical political economists because in a sense that's Marx's raw material and he's applying a critical method to it and you see that at work in these chapters. He says, well, this is how Ricardo looks at it, and Smith looked at it, and Ricardo looked at it. And, and through critiquing them, I can come to another uh, understanding. But the second thing, I think, was a political uh, decision. Um, political economy of that period had a kind of utopian side to it. And, and, and everybody was kind of saying, if only you could have a freely functioning market and a, the state doing the right kinds of things and you could get rid of monopoly and get rid of uh, excessive state interference, then we would have a perfect world. So there was a, a notion that the public policy and it, it, our thinking should be dedicated to trying to implement the world that the classical political economists were depicting. So Marx wanted to take that utopian vision of the classical political economists and then say, well, let's work it through and see what actually happens. And instead of this world working to the benefit of all, which was a sort of Adam Smith thesis, what you see is it works to the benefit of capital and works to the detriment of the mass of the population that is going to be reduced to greater and greater poverty. So, so Marx wanted, in effect, in effect, to sort of confront that utopian vision and to say it's actually dystopian, not utopian. Hmm. I think we often hear a very similar argument coming from economists today that if we could just let the free market run its course and if we just let these, these free market principles um, um, evolve to their greatest extent that, you know, that we'll have this, a similar sort of utopia. Yes, well, I mean, you know, we've had 30 years of that right. and look at the levels of income inequality uh, that have arisen almost everywhere in the world where these nostrums have been uh, applied, and I think that that is you know, one of the crucial insights you get from Marx, which is the more you move in that direction in, in policy terms, the more the rich are going to actually get far, far richer, and the poor are going to be relatively impoverished. Do you find that, particularly in our own moment, that the class relation is becoming even more evident? 
Well, the curious thing about that is uh, the answer is yes in objective terms, but in subjective terms, a lot of people don't see it. Right. And that, again, is part of the masking effect, uh, which Marx talks about when he talks about fetishism, that the, the, the underlying social realities get, get, con you know, get concealed from us by these market processes. Mm -hmm. and, and to the degree that we all believe, in, to some level, in market individualism, if things are going bad for us, it must be our own fault. Mm -hmm. So people don't see the class relation, and of course there is a, a lot of polemical work done to make sure that we don't see it. So, because as soon as people start to see it, then there starts to be class action. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of my favorite quotes right now is from Warren Buffett. He was asked about, is there a class war? And he said, sure, there's class war. And it's my class, the rich, who are waging it, and we're winning. And I think that this is a very telling kind of, uh, way of representing the situation right now. I'm not going to spend uh, much time on the uh, questions of repairs, replacements, of maintenance, uh, what the railway manuals show and all those kinds of things. Um, yeah, the, the only important thing to realize is that what Marx does is to say that those all belong to circulating capital. Uh, all those little bits and pieces that are going there to keep the sort of machinery running and uh, fix it up and repair it and all those sorts of things. Uh, and uh, of course the difficulty with replacement is that with most, mach most machines different bits wear out at different rates at different times. And so there's a very complicated kind of relationship as to how many bits you have to replace until you've actually replaced the whole machine. You know, and so as he starts to say, well, this is, uh, you know, this is a pretty blurred uh, category. And then there's also sort of issues about uh, the monetary circulation, which are rather significant because uh, when you buy a machine, uh, you buy a, a commodity and you buy it all at one time. So you subtract from commodity and then you don't go back into the commodity market for some considerable time. And so there's a lot of excess money out there now because you just bought the machine. Then you begin to recuperate the value of the machine over time. What do you do with the bits and pieces of money that you recuperate each year? Well, you hoard them. So there is a, a, a time difference between, if you like, the commodity exchanges and the monetary exchanges. And, of course, by hoarding, you're taking money out of circulation. So you launch all the money into circulation at one particular moment, and then you come out of it at another. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, that in a minute. So what th this tends to generate are certain cyclical movements in terms of both the purchase of fixed capital and also the flows of money into the market. And if everybody goes in and buys fixed capital at the same time, and suddenly there's a vast amount of money in the market, and com commodities have been withdrawn, and so there's a deficit of commodities and, and money. So again, there's a demand-supply kind of inequality which is uh, being set up here, and uh, a distinction that is being created in the monetary circulation versus the commodity circulation. Um, I'm not going to go into that here because this is taken up in much greater detail uh, much later and we'll look at it there. The issue I really wanted to concentrate on here <coughs> is one that comes up rather late in uh, <coughs> this chapter on fixed and circulating capital and, uh, and, and it has to do with the category that Marx calls moral depreciation. Now, in Volume 1 of Capital, he had highlighted this. Um, and so it's a little surprising that he doesn't highlight it more here, because it's a, it's a, it's, this is a really big issue. And it's so serious that uh, some very reputable economists looking at Marx's analysis and favorable to what Marx is doing, uh, will say that this issue actually undermines Marx's value theory entirely. 
that uh, you can't really maintain Marx's value theory in the form that he articulated it because you're up against uh, a real set of, uh, of problems here that just cannot be handled in terms of uh, the value theory. So I alert you to that, and, uh, it, and it largely does arise out of uh, this question of moral depreciation. So let's see what he says about it, and then let's talk a, a little bit about it. On page 250, at the top there he says, finally, as is the case through, throughout large-scale industry, he calls it moral deterioration also plays a part. Um, after ten years have elapsed, it is generally possible to buy the same quantity of carriages and locomotives for £30,000 as previously cost £40,000. A depreciation of 25% on the market price must thus be reckoned with on this material, even if there is no depreciation in the use value. And then he talks about something when I mentioned that by and large in Volume 2 he's leaving out technological change, but here he can't afford to. He says, the means of labour are for the most part constantly revolutionised by the progress of industry. Hence they are not replaced in their original form, but in the revolutionised form. On the one hand, the volume of fixed capital that is invested in a particular natural form and has to last out for a definite average lifespan within this is a reason why new machines, etc., are introduced only gradually, and hence forms an obstacle to the rapid general introduction of improved means of labour. On the other hand, competition forces the replacement of old means of labour by new ones before their natural demise, particularly when decisive revolutions have taken place. Catastrophes, crises, etc., are the principal causes that compel such premature renewals of equipment on a broad social scale. So instead of thinking about a, a fixed depreciation schedule of this sort, we have to deal with the fact that the depreciation is maybe messed up by the fact that competition is pushing us to do something different. It gets taken up again on page 264, again apologies for jumping around. Um, to the same extent, he says, as the value and durability of the fixed capital applied develops with the development of the capitalist mode of production, so also does the life of industry and industrial capital and each particular investment develop extending to several years, say an average of ten years. If the development of fixed capital extends this life, on the one hand, it is cut short on the other by the constant revolutionising of the means of production, which also increases steadily with the development of the capitalist mode of production. This also leads to changes in the means of production. They constantly have to be replaced, because of their moral depreciation, long before they are physically exhausted. We can assume that, for the most important branches of large-scale industry, this life cycle is now, on average, a ten-year one. The precise figure is not important here. The result is that the cycle of related turnovers, extending over a number of years, within which the capital is confined by its fixed component, is one of the material foundations for the periodic cycle in which business passes through successive periods of stagnation, moderate activity, overexcitement, and crisis. The periods for which capital is invested certainly differ greatly and do not coincide in time, but a crisis is always the starting point of a large volume of new investment. It is also, therefore, if we consider the society as a whole, more or less a new material basis for the next turnover cycle. Now what's involved here is, if I've bought a machine for £10,000, and it's going to last ten years, I'm expecting that its use value to me is going to be such that I can get back a thousand pounds a year for ten years. And by the end of ten years I will have ten thousand pounds hoarded, and I then go back into the market and buy the replacement of the machine. Now, there are a number of problems with this. Uh, the first is, when I go back into the market to buy the machine, it may not cost the same thing. So that's the first problem. The replacement cost is not necessarily the same as the depreciated cost. So what is the value of the machine? Is it its replacement cost, or its depreciated, you know, its depreciating value through use? So that's, if you like, the first conundrum. The second, however, is even more problematic. 
the value of the machine to the capitalist is this, that the, that the machine helps the capitalist gain relative surplus value. Now, I don't know if you remember the conundrum in Volume 1. Machines cannot be a source of value, but they can be a source of relative surplus value. But they're a, a source of relative surplus value only to the degree that, that I possess a superior machine to you. So my superior machine is, you know, is giving me relative surplus value because I have a superior machine. What happens when a bunch of people suddenly get superior machines to me? My machine cannot help me produce the relative surplus value I, I had before. Which goes back to that language of how effective is the machine. And plainly the effectiveness of the machine cannot be judged outside of its capacity to help me produce relative surplus value relative to what all the other capitalists are doing. If, say, after five years, suddenly somebody comes on the market with an identical machine which I paid ten thousand pounds for, and somebody comes on the market and says you can have it for five thousand pounds, and everybody else suddenly buys the same machine for five thousand pounds, what does that do to the value of my machine? Well, I can still try and get back the thousand pounds a year out of it, but everybody else will only want to get five hundred out of it and I'll be at a competitive disadvantage in the market, and I'll probably have to bring it down to 500. So I will not be able to get back the whole of the value of my machine. Now that was one of the reasons, and it is mentioned very briefly here, but this was, that was one of the reasons why Marx mentioned in Volume 1 that it is this problem that drives the capitalists to try to use up a machine as fast as they can, to avoid any problems of moral depreciation. Which then leads immediately to putting pressure on labour to use the machine, because as he says here, wear and tear depends on its use. And if I use it more intensively, then I've used up the machine faster, and it doesn't last ten years, it only lasts five years. And if, say, instead of employing it only for twelve hours a day, I employ it for twenty-four hours a day, then I can get back my ten thousand pounds faster. Which leads then the capitalist to want to have shift work, night work, and all the rest of it. And Marx outlines a lot of that in Volume 1, he's not taking that up very systematically here at all, he mentions it a couple of times. But the moral depreciation is a real serious problem. Because at any point in the lifetime of the machine, how do I figure out what its value is? And this is, you know, this is a real, a real conundrum. Now, one of the solutions to this, which is perhaps the only solution you can imagine, is to say, well, actually, why don't we do the accounting this way? Why don't we say, at the end of a particular turnover period, the capitalist has produced two things. One is they produce the commodity, which they have sold in the market. The other thing is they've produced a slightly depreciated machine. Okay. So at the end of the first year, or if we take it on a yearly basis, the end of the first year, I've produced the commodity and I've produced a machine that I bought the year before for 10,000 and it's now worth 9,000. So I go into the market and I say, well, who's going to give me 9,000? And you can, of course, sell machines. Sewing machines, if you like. It's a bit harder to sell factories and so on. But the accounting in this case, what it does is then to say, well, what what is the, the value of the, that machine in the market at the end of the first year? And it's not necessarily 9,000 pounds. I mean, if somebody has come in and sort of at the end of the first year produced a comparative machine for 5,000 pounds, it's only worth 5,000 pounds. 
So I've, I, in a sense, I've, I've, I've lost 4,000. But at least I know what its market value is. That is, I treat it as, treat this whole process in terms of what we call joint products. Now joint products actually are a problem in economics in general, and joint products are a problem for Marx. I mean, what is the value of a sheep when uh, it's meat, it's hides, it's wool? I mean, you know. So, so it actually, and, and, and a lot of a lot of production processes end up being joint products. And he's really talked already about a joint use kind of thing with oxen. That they can be used as fixed capital, or they can be used as part of the circulating capital. So what you do is you introduce this into this question of moral depreciation. You you can you can start to look at it. So you have three ways of, if you like, valuing the machine. One would be, all right, it's straight line depreciation. But that's, that's a fantasy, that's an ideal, that's not how things actually do get valued in competitive markets. <coughs> if somebody else comes in and produces in, in, in this year something of that sort, then the depreciated value of the machine is now equal to the value of the new machine. Well, what would you rather have, the new machine or an old machine depreciated value? If, of course, you get something of this sort, that it's down here, then, then clearly I have to drop down here and then do my depreciation like that. So moral depreciation is is, in, is infecting, if you like, this whole question of the, the value of the machine. And so that's one way is that to, to do this. Now, there are, there are ways to think about this which actually do enter into the calculation. One is, as, as he starts to say here, well, you, you guess uh, what, what the trajectory of technological innovation is going to be like and you engage in accelerated depreciation, or you engage in planned obsolescence. That is, you have a physical machine that can last uh, ten years, but you plan actually to replace it after five. And you may actually after five sell the, the, you know, the, the remaining use value on the machine for something, so you, you can plan obsolescence in this. But that's an accounting gimmick, as it were. It doesn't fit very well. It's a pricing gimmick which doesn't fit very well with the value theory, which is that a machine has a socially necessary labour time embodied in it. I like the, the joint product solution by saying, well, the machine is ideally, if you want to say that, because you don't actually do it, it's ideally it is a joint product at the end of a particular turnover period. And then you can make the decision to sell the machine, revalue it, or, or whatever. Now, if you revalue it, I mean, if, if, if something comes in and, and, and the machine is totally worthless and you chuck it out so you've just lost the value, but revaluation, is that, is that permitted in the Marxian scheme of things? Most economists looking at this say, no, you can't do that. It's not consistent with the value theory. The way I try and skedaddle out of this is to say, look, Marx says a thing only has value if it also has a use value. If it hasn't got a use value, then it's not value. So at the end of every production cycle, you have to ask the question, what is the use value of the machine? And if the use value is less after one year than it was when you bought it, you obviously have a different value in the machine, because the use value is changing. In other words, that's where this, this language, which I, I mentioned earlier, about effective, what was effective, 
in, in this process becomes rather significant. Back on 238, when he said, As long as a means of labour still remains effective, and does not yet have to be replaced by a new item of the same kind, some, some constant capital value remains fixed in it. He doesn't go into this question of what is effective. And when he says some constant capital value remains fixed in it, how much is surely tied to how effective it is? And the effectiveness is the use value of the machine in helping produce surplus value. If it no longer helps produce surplus value, it's not being effective. So the value of the machine gets reduced so that it can still produce the surplus value which is equivalent to the surplus value which your competitors are producing. So the value of this fixed capital is, is a real, real problem in Marxian theory, but it's not only a problem in Marxian theory, it also turns out to be a huge problem in conventional economics. I mean, how do you value a capital asset? Well, we just went through this wonderful period, right? When, when you know, the banks are kind of saying, well, I have all of these mortgages, uh, claims to these titles, this is a capital assets, and I value them at da 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 da. And people say, how can they have any value when there's no market? You can't sell them anywhere. And the answer will be, well, but you know, there will be a market one day, and then, then I'll be able to sell them, uh, but, and, but the value of that house it was built for so and so and so and so and so. And so. But there's, there's tremendous controversy, for instance, on asset valuation in, 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 in capitalist institutions. If you insist on something that's called mark to market, i.e., what you would get for it if you sold it in the market, in that period when there was no market, you would have to have written all of those values assets down to zero. And if you did that, the banks would have been completely bankrupt. So they came up with some fictitious number to say, well, actually the assets on our books are worth, you know, three hundred million dollars or something like that. So so and and so there's a huge argument actually in the, in the, amongst the capitalists, to how, how to value assets, and it's not, and it's, and of course, these are consumer goods like housing, but the same would be true of machines. How do you value machines? Well, sewing machines you could find out pretty easily because you know you know what the second-hand value is. The sewing machines are being traded all the time. One of the other ways you could do it is, of course, to lease. The capitalists can lease. So each year, instead of, uh, instead of buying a forklift truck, you, you lease it. In which case, you only lease it for one turnover period. And then you go back and you turn, convert ca fixed capital into circulating capital because you only do it in exactly the same rate as your turnover period. So you could lease it. You could rent it. Yeah. This issue of moral depreciation, it, it seems like it's tied up very much with technological um, innovation yeah. and improving machines. And I'm just going back to his, like at the very beginning of volume two here, where he's saying, I'm not going to talk about right. this, that, or the other thing. I'm talking about the pure state of yeah. circulation. And so, like, what, how, do you re or how do you reconcile that with? There are moments when he has, he has to break. I mean, we've seen several moments when he's broken that kind of kind of rule. And this is one of those moments where, where he's dealing with fixed capital. He's tried to, to, to stick with the, the rule by giving us fixed, but he knows that actually out there there is this fixed capital valuation problem, which he's shied away from here. He really has. I mean, I'm, I mean it, it's a bit surprising. I mean, there's more about it in, in the Grundrisse, and there's actually is, there's just as much about it in Volume 1 as there is here. And I suspect he shied away from it precisely because he couldn't see a way uh, to do it that was very, you know. There are moments when he comes very close to proposing a joint product kind of uh, solution. I mean, there are a couple of moments where he, 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 does, he does that, 243. 
And he says, its value thus acquires a dual existence. A part of it remains tied to its use form or natural form, which pertains to the production process, while another part separates off from this form as money. The dual existence there has the possibility of, you know, simply saying, well, the dual existence also is about the, the, the relationship of value to the use form. I, the only way I can, I, I can reconcile the, the, the underlying value theory is precisely to, 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 to go back to that phrase when he kind of says, if a thing has no use value, it's no value. Well, if it has diminished use value, it has less value. So, instead of it being an either-or, it has value or it doesn't have value, you would have actually a sliding scale of possible values there, depending upon its degree of utility. And that's where this business of its, its level of effect, uh, eff effectiveness starts to become, I think, significant. And, other, and, and that has to be looked at in use-value terms. Now, again, Marx is very reluctant to allow questions of use-value back into uh, the argument. And, and I think what's going on here is he wants to keep that out, he wants to keep the credit system out, he wants to keep all these things out, so he doesn't actually get to the point where he could actually propose an adequate solution uh, to this problem, uh, which, which leaves us all with uh, a, a kind of a bit of a, a messy sort of situation. But all I, can, all I can say is that if uh, this is destructive of, of Marx's value theory, uh, the fixed capital asset problem in, in classical economics actually destroys the whole of, of neoclassical economic theory. And this was shown in the capital theory controversies way back uh, in the 1970s. And the way the, the way the conventional economists did with it, they said, well, yeah, it's right, but we're not going to take any notice of it. We're just going to act as if it's not a problem. So I kind of think, well, if they can do it, why can't Marxists, you know, I mean, sorry. <laughs> uh, I mean, if they can fantasize that there's not a problem when they know there is, and when you see that problem emerging, as we did in this, this, this it was so interesting just reading this business press about, you know, how, do, how, how, how are these housing values being, how are they being valued? Yeah. Are we not dealing with sort of an inflation between price and value here? I mean, because. I, I think, I, if I remember correctly from uh, volume one, I think it is, where he says that, you know, they're, they're never going to meet, you know, but, but, but yeah. value ends up being that regulative law of nature, like gravity, where the house will tumble in and things get out of balance. So if you can't, I mean, the idea that you couldn't actually put, I mean, we're talking about pricing it, I mean, you can always put a price on something, but the idea that you can't put a value on a machine that's been used for a little bit, it seems like you couldn't do that with any commodity, because the price and value will always be, um, Somehow, yeah, There are two things here. One is the money price is never going to be exactly. So Marx is talking about equilibrium prices, which are roughly equivalent to value. So he's kind of saying, I work with the value theory because, you know, when supply and demand are in equilibrium, they generate an equilibrium price, and the equilibrium prices are what I'm working with. Now he should be able to say the same. So he should be able to say that about all commodities. Okay, and yeah, he knows that the the price of commodities is going up and down, down, you know, all this kind of stuff. We know, you know, he knows that. But the value structure still is in is intact. It's still a regulative kind of thing. But here we have a situation where you just can't say, oh, it's going to be solved by going into the prices. You have to kind of find a way to somehow or other make the value of this commodity, which is a machine, and it's sold to you as a commodity, and you then hang on to it and you're passing value through it. And this comes back to this fact that it's a use value, and, 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 and it rem the use value remains fixed, and, and you've, you're generating this flow. Well, how much flow is coming out of this fixed thing? And, 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 and that's, that's the dilemma. And you, 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 can't, you can't calculate that independent of what it is that that, that fixed use value is permitting you to do in you know, its effectiveness in producing surplus value. So I, I mean, my, like I say, my argument is, well, all right, I, I, like I wiggle out of it, if you like, by this kind of maneuver of saying, well, it just depends upon its, its usefulness. And, it, and its usefulness is, is, is measured by 
its capacity to help, the, help you gain surplus value. And if it's not helping you gain surplus value, it's, it, it, it's, it, it's less useful. So you have to diminish it, its value so the surplus value comes back to you and you can keep on having to, and, and you may come down to zero in five years, in which case, you know, you have to go back in the market and buy another machine. If they're becoming much, much more efficient. I mean, yeah. What happens when the fixed capital is produced by the state and paid for by the taxes of the workers? As soon as you get into that, this, this does crop up in the next chapter where Marx talks about very large scale investments um, in ports and harbors and things like that are, are generally too big to be taken by private capital. Therefore, uh, they're undertaken by the state because nobody else can afford the length of time or the amount of money that's involved in putting it up front. So the state certainly has a very important role to play, particularly in the physical infrastructures, obviously. But how does that value get sort of measured by the, the capitalists? Well, because they're just taking it and not... The classic way in which the state would do this would be to borrow money and then build the bridge. Right? Then they have to pay off the, the, the interest and the, uh, and, and the principal for building the bridge. So the state acts like... A, a, a mini capitalist in a way, except that, well, this is very interesting, the physical infrastructure is made available to the people who use it, not for the full value, but simply on the basis of the interest which is being paid. So a lot of fixed capital in, in a state-run situation will be circulating just Instead of you paying the whole principal and, and, and the interest, you just pay the interest on it. And of course, classically, um, the state will also pay for it with taxation and so on. But the obvious, I mean, you could do it that way, but the obvious uh, way to do it would be to have a bond issue. And then in return, and then all you need, and then the, the interest on that bond is how capital circulates through the bridge is through state debt. And we'll see, he, in the next chapter he has some stuff about uh, kinds of activities that get uh, done via the state. Any other? Yeah. Um, I was wondering, we have been talking about physical fixed capital. I was wondering whether there are also, also kinds of fixed capital that are non-physical or immaterial. Like what? <laughs> <laughs> or you mean knowledge? Uh, I, I've been thinking about softwares. Mm. Yeah. For instance, like financial capital makes softwares for yeah. circulate. And, but I'm not sure that that can be considered a fixed capital. No, typically that would be circulating. I mean, again, you just use it and you, you pay for it as you use it, right? Or are you talking about the software that's incorporated into the machine? In which case, it's part of the machine. Well, Your computer incorporates. So for running the software, you also need the hardware, but they go together. Yeah. As he says, when he says, the, you know, a fixed capital is the power of knowledge objectified. I think he would kind of say, well, you know, a machine, a machine that incorporates you know, software is, is part of what we're talking about here. So software. Um, the difficulty uh, comes with um, uh, things like, uh, well, we, we, it's difficult to get into this. When you get into questions of spectacle, and uh, so on. Um, uh, you can't really go very much further with the analysis that he has up to this point. You need a lot more ammunition to, to be able to analyze those kinds of questions. I tended to uh, uh, analyze those, those questions with the category of monopoly rent, which is in volume three. Um, so you can, you, there are things you can, you can do, but again, you have to uh, use other parts of the analysis in order to incorporate 
many of those issues into uh, the argument. But it, but it can be done. The other thing is that when you look at the volumes of fixed capital with which we're now surrounded, and the huge amount of monies that go into the consumption fund, and how the consumption fund is itself a, when merchants get hold of it, becomes a source of considerable profit and extraction of surplus value through real estate brokers and all the rest of it. In other words, if you look at the housing market as part of the consumption fund, you would not say this is outside of the general dynamics of capital accumulation. What you would say is that it is not part of fixed capital in the way that Marx is talking about it here, which is narrowly defined as the production process. That production process, of course, goes on in the production of a house. But the house is a commodity, and then the commodity is sold at its value, presumably. And as it's sold at its value, so then people who buy it uh, may find themselves having to face either the credit system or the merchant capitalist or whatever as what Marx called a secondary form of exploitation which exists in society. Now Marx does not make much of these secondary forms of exploitation. They are generally mentioned in uh, the uh, Communist Manifesto and they get occasional mention here. But I think that if you look at something like the housing market, you would have to say that this is, you know, the way that, that, that ownership titles circulate in the housing market, what goes on with mortgage securitization, all those kinds of questions, starts to become a very much integrated into the dynamics of what finance is all about. And we're going to get into some of that when we get into the credit system after we do merchant capital. And uh, the idea of doing merchant capital right now, as I suggested at the outset, is to put some flesh and bones on the general category of commodity capital. And you remember that Marx argued commodity capital is terribly important to look at, particularly when you want to understand the aggregate circulation in society, because commodity capital is about matching how much you know, iron ore you need to produce so much steel and how much steel you need to produce a car. And all of those match-ups are very much about the physical nature of the commodities which are being sold and circulated. And then what the role of the merchant is in helping circulate or in some cases forming an independent uh, source of power uh, which can challenge, if you like, the power of productive capital. And so, rather than sort of talking about it simply in terms of functions, as we did in the first three chapters, we start to look at it in terms of agents. Who are the agents? What do the agents claim? What can the agents do? And how can the agents screw things up? I mean, Marx is always kind of interested in, in those questions. And so that's what we're going to look at when we get into uh, merchants' capital. And this uh, actually came in a, the section on replacement repairs and accumulation of fixed capital. So it starts on 251, where Marx talks about the, the way in which uh, repairs and replacement can morph into a gradual extension of a business in the course of partial renewal. And this can happen two ways, he says, uh, extensively if the field of production is extended, intensively if the means of production are made more effective. And he then considers the extensive side of this, and on the next page he says, um, this in turn depends to a large extent on the space available. In some buildings extra floors can be added while others require horizontal extension and thus more land. While capitalist production is marked by the waste of much material, there is also much inappropriate horizontal extension of this kind, partly involving a loss of labour power, in the course of the gradual extension of a business since nothing is done according to a social plan but rather depends on the infinitely varied circumstances, means, etc., with which the individual capitalist acts. The progressive reinvestment of the money reserve fund, of the part of the fixed capital that is transformed back into money, 
is most easily affected in agriculture. Here a spatially given field of production is capable of the greatest gradual absorption of capital. The same is true when natural reproduction takes place as in the case of cattle breeding. Now you're probably uh, going to think I'm clinging on to little straws of ideas, and in effect I am, but that's one of the fun, <laughs> that's one of the, well, it's one of the fun things of uh, dealing with volume two of capital, there are all these little bits like this that you can actually then blow up into a sort of whole books and things, and that's what makes the volume for me particularly exciting. Now, uh, being a geographer of course, I'm very much interested in the whole theme of the production of space, and how space gets uh, produced, how urban spaces get produced, how agrarian landscapes are transformed, and of course there is the, the famous book by Henri Lefebvre, Marx, it's called The Production of Space. And within Marxian theory in general, that's sort of treated as somehow or other over there, you know, I mean, it's not integrable into the general dynamics, but here is a passage which actually integrates it, and kind of opens up the possibility to talk about the production of space, but does it in a way, I think, particularly in the agricultural case, which is of particular interest to me, that he's talking here about uh, a spatially given field of production capable of the greatest gradual absorption of capital. Now one of the arguments I've been making about urbanization and all the rest of it is that this is one of the major means by which surplus capital gets absorbed. And so here is Marx talking about the absorption of capital. Uh, through extension of the whole system. And so, if you like, the whole dynamics of the, the geography of the system is going to be transformed as you absorb surplus capital in this, in this way. And in these few paragraphs, what Marx does is open up the possibility for people like me to pretend I'm a legitimate Marxist by kind of saying, well, you know, on, 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 on page 252 of Capital, Volume 2, he says this, and I'm just developing that idea, you know, instead of being viewed as some unorthodox person who wants to talk about m space and spatiality and all those other nutty things that we geographers like to talk about. But I think actually it's a very important way in which uh, it, it can be integrated into, into, into Marxian theory, and it does integrate with all the other stuff about transportation and so on, which goes on in, in Volume 2 of Capital rather nicely, and, and, and flows and absorption of surplus capital and, and all the rest of it. So um, I think this is, like I said, again, one of those moments where there's something here uh, which can be really r built upon in a, in a radical way. So make sure you, you get all of uh, Volume 3 and uh, Chapter 20, then 16, 17, 18, and 19.